Okay, so welcome everyone to the March Camaraderie. Um, my name is Terry Humphreys and um, I'm here from Curtin University um, introducing the speakers and our events tonight. Um, so I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of land we're meeting on today and I wish to acknowledge and um, respect their culture and their contribution that they make to um, the city and the region. Normally we get uh, either academic or someone from industry come along and talk about the work that they do and uh, give us an insight into different aspects of chemistry. Um, so, uh, but today uh, I thought we'd get in a couple of the students that were at the RACI Congress um, in Brisbane last year. Um, so these students from WA uh, won um, poster prizes and um, flash talk prizes and so I thought we'd uh, come and give them a bit more of limelight and uh, let us know what they, why they want. Uh, so our first speaker is going to be Ashley Gallagher from Curtin University and she's going to talk on the synthesis and biological evaluation of anti-parasitic compounds. Uh, so yes, she won the Medicinal Chemistry and Chemical Biology, um, Bio Biology uh, Symposium Collaborative Drug Discovery Section of the RSCI Congress. Um, as mentioned, she's a PhD student here um, and her researchers, um, her supervisors are Myra Mosrino, Hendra Gunasawaro, and Jason Chaplin. I apologise if I've just said that name. Um, her research is focused on the synthesis of antiparasitic compounds for malaria and a variety of neglected tropical diseases. She graduated from a, um, with first honours in chemistry in 2019, and she is a recipient of the Rose Scientific Scholarship for her PhD. So I want to thank Reg, who's in, also in the audience here, for giving her the scholarship. Um, and so, yes, let's invite her up to um, give her talk today. Um, I'm Ashley, and I'm going to share some of my research that I've done in my PhD. Um, but first, I just want you to imagine for a second that you are living in a rural village in Malawi, a country in Southeast Africa, so something that looks a little bit like this. And one of your loved ones starts to feel a bit unwell, you know, headache, fever, fatigue, but normal flu-like symptoms, so you don't think too much of it. After a few weeks, however, they start to deteriorate. They're not acting like themselves, they're feeling really apathetic, um, having these random outbursts of anger, and they're becoming progressively confused. Um, and then they start complaining that they're not sleeping at night and begin sleeping a lot during the day and all of a sudden you know exactly what it could be, sleeping sickness, or more accurately, human African trypanosomiasis or HAT, a disease caused by a parasite that's transmitted by the bite of a tsetse fly. You know you need to seek medical help but when you do, you're told that the parasite has already entered their central nervous system and at this stage their only treatment option is a drug called melaseprol. This drug is highly toxic and there's about a 5% chance that the drug itself will kill them and about a 30% chance that treatment will fail due to parasitic drug resistance. But they take the treatment anyway because you know that without it there is almost certainty that they'll be dead within the next six months. This is terrifying, isn't it? Um, but unfortunately, it is the devastating reality for those affected by HAT. And this is why I believe that it is so vital that new anti-parasitic drugs are developed, not only for HAT, but also for other similar diseases that are in desperate need of new treatment options. So, I guess to begin with, the culprit of these diseases are these little single-celled microorganisms known as parasitic protozoa. Uh, and these rely on a host organism for their survival, usually causing significant harm to the host. So those that can infect humans are the cause of a number of different diseases. Some of the major ones you can see popping up on the screen now, but there are many more as well. And collectively, they put billions of individuals at risk and cause hundreds of thousands of deaths annually. So they have a really significant global impact. Broadly, we can kind of categorise the parasitic protozoa responsible for these diseases into three main groups. Um, first of all, the ones that infect the intestinal tract, and these are predominantly transmitted by what is known as the fecal oral route, so through contaminated food or drinking water or via person-to-person -person contact. 
This uh, one all kind of by itself here infects the urogenital tract and is sexually transmitted. And then you have those that infect the blood and tissue, and these are predominantly transmitted by insect vectors. And so it's this group of um, vector-borne parasitic protozoan diseases that have been the focus of my research. Today, for the interest of time, I'm basically only going to share with you my work on, in regards to HAT. Um, but I have looked at all four of these diseases throughout my PhD. So a bit of a closer look. Uh, malaria is probably the one that everyone's heard of, and rightly so, it is the most significant of the parasitic protozoan diseases, putting around half the world's population at risk. And in 2021, it caused about 620,000 deaths. So it does have a really huge global impact. The other ones you may not have heard of, Chagas disease, Hat and Leishmaniasis, all predominantly infect impoverished communities. And so as a result, they've historically not had as much research interest or funding. And this has led to them all being classified as neglected tropical diseases. So obviously they're all caused by parasitic protozoa that are transmitted by various insect vectors. But the other thing that they all have in common is that they are all in need of new treatment options. So a huge problem is that there's not really any available vaccinations for these diseases. You may have seen somewhat recently um, a vaccination for malaria has actually been rolled out, which is a huge breakthrough, really exciting. But the efficacy of this vaccination is still really, really low. So there's still a long way to go on the vaccination side of things. And this just means that the control of these diseases heavily relies on effective treatments. And as you got a bit of insight into, as I spoke about HAT at the start, um, the current treatment options face a number of drawbacks, and this includes things like negative side effects, low efficacy, long and extensive treatment regimes, and their efficacy is being threatened by this emergence of parasitic drug resistance. So it's really, really important that there is ongoing research and development of anti-parasitic compounds. So that's kind of where my research comes in, uh, but first of all I just want to give you a brief history of my project. So. My project actually started at EpiChem, where they found that this tetrahydroacyquinoline had activity against TB Rhodesians, which is one of the parasites responsible for HAT. So that's really exciting. Um, even more exciting, they were willing to collaborate with us here at Curtin, and a PhD student, Danica Cullen, jumped on board, along with a few honours and third year students since then, and got to work synthesising derivatives of this scaffold. Um, and yeah, all of these derivatives were sent to our collaborators at Biotech in Thailand, who kindly tested them all against the parasite for us. And so fast forward a few years and about 80 novel derivatives later, and we have a pretty good idea of the structure activity relationship of this scaffold in relation to its activity against Rhodesians. So, um, most of the past work has been performed on this isomer of the scaffold here. A small amount of work has also been done on this second scaffold. But what I mainly want to draw your attention to is that the nitrogen was found to be essential for the activity, but converting this tertiary amine into a secondary amine was seen to lead to an improvement in the activity of the compounds. Um, in addition, larger groups at this phenolic position was also seen to lead to an improvement in that activity. And then finally, substitution at this benzylic alcohol, as well as the stereochemistry at that position, didn't really seem to play any role. So based on this information, one of the aims of my project has been to try and synthesise derivatives with improved activity against the parasite. Uh, so my first port of call was to try and synthesise some secondary amine derivatives with some larger groups at the phenolic position. So to do this, I start with this commercially available norphenolephrine hydrochloride and I can cyclize that with formaldehyde and that gives me both of the isomers of that secondary amine scaffold. Um, from there, I can protect my nitrogen with a bot group, which allows me to selectively modify my phenol. And I predominantly do this just with simple alkylation reactions with a range of alkyl halides to get some derivatives that look something like this. 
Uh, from there, I kind of have two routes that I can take. The first being I can just deprotect my amine and have my final compound as the hydrochloride salt, the secondary amine. Um, or if I have alkylated with something like these bromobenzyl groups, I can further modify that substituent and couple it with a variety of boronic acids in Suzuki cross-coupling reactions. And so this was mainly the route that I took because, as I mentioned earlier, I wanted some larger substituents at this position. And so I put them into Suzuki's, deprotected them, and using this method I made about 19 different derivatives to send off to biotech. I'm not going to bombard you with all of the biological results, but a little bit of an overview. Um, as you can see here, about 16 of our 19 derivatives had an IC50, which is the half maximal inhibitory concentration against the parasite of below 0.5 micromolar. So that's becoming comparable to some of the current treatment options for HAT, which is really exciting. Um, we also had some quite promising selectivity index values. So that is essentially a ratio of the IC50 against Vero cells, which are mammalian cells, that's give us an idea of the toxicity of the compounds, versus the IC50 against TB rhodesians, so how selective my compounds are for the parasite. Um, and so of those 16 compounds, only three of them had a selectivity index value of less than 50, and actually the majority of them had a selectivity index of above 90, with five of them I mean, sorry, above 50, with about five of them above 90. So that was some really promising results. Um, a little bit of a zoom in to see some of the trends. Just a comparison between that tertiary amine that was previously looked at versus my secondary amine derivatives here. In not all cases, but in some, we did see that expected improvement. So here you can see the IC50 um, drops by about tenfold. So that was um, a really exciting. The toxicity didn't change much, which means we get a much better selectivity index as well. Uh, in other cases, such as this one, this here was identified as one of the most promising tertiary amine derivatives, but that good potency against the parasite also led to quite a high toxicity. So converting that tertiary amine into a secondary amine, we maintain that good activity. It didn't really change too much but we lower the toxicity significantly, meaning we have a much better selectivity index. Uh, and then I guess comparing smaller to larger substituents at this position, uh, in almost every single case, our biphenyl substituents were much more active than the smaller benzyl substituents. You can see here again about a tenfold increase when we increase the size of that substituent. Um, that did increase the toxicity slightly too, but our selectivity index is still far, far better. So, yeah, that was in every single case except one. This was the one exception to the rule where this bromobenzyl derivative um, had comparable activity to all of those um, biphenyl substituents <laughs> and it's also one of the most selective compounds that we've synthesized as well. So that was a really exciting result. So moving on, I also wanted to investigate what would happen if we expanded the size of this aliphatic ring system. Uh, that's something that is just commonly done in medicinal chemistry as it increases the flexibility in that ring system and could allow for um, improved bounding in whatever target site um, we're working in. So I wanted to maintain that secondary amine and larger groups and then try and see what would happen if we increase the size of that ring. So to start with, um, I began with 7 or 6 methoxy tetralone, and I did this really cool reaction called a Schmidt reaction that essentially just inserts the nitrogen into the ring. Um, and I can control the conditions so that this is my major product. And I wanted this as my major product because if we reduce that amide and demethylate it, our phenol, we have something that if we flip it, starts to look really similar to the tetrahydroacyclinolines I was working with before. So this is a benzoazepine scaffold, um, and I can do very similar chemistry that I described before. So I can protect that nitrogen, modify it my phenol, and then deprotect to obtain some of those derivatives. So I made about eight different derivatives of these ones just to get a bit of a gauge 
of whether they were going to be promising or not. Um, and they are with biotech, but we don't have results yet. But just a bit of um, an example of the types of things that I made. This one might look familiar. It's kind of analogous to um, one of the tetrahydroacyclamine derivatives that was looking really promising that I showed you earlier. Um, as a bonus, I also got some really pretty crystals from it and got some X-ray crystallography done. Um, and then I also tried some biphenyl, aliphatic substituents, things like that. Um, and they have all been sent to biotech as well. Uh, so just in summary, for my work on HAT, I synthesized 19 different tetrahydroacyclinoline derivatives, fully characterized them all, and sent them to Thailand, where they were tested against Rhodesians. Um, 16 of those have really good IC50 values, and 13 of them have a selectivity index of above 50. So it's really exciting. Uh, we also I also synthesized eight benzoazepine derivatives, which have also been sent, but we are waiting, awaiting those biological results. So yeah. Um, last of all, I just have a lot of thank yous because my project does not happen without a lot of collaboration and people helping me. So um, to Moro and Hendra, my supervisors, um, Caitlin and the rest of my research group as well for all of their help. Uh, the Australian government and Moro Scientific for the scholarships to be doing this PhD. Um, Epichem because my project would not exist without them. Uh, and biotech for doing all of the biological testing um, for HAT and also for malaria. They do all the malarial testing as well. I haven't really spoken about Chagas or Leash, but um, these are the people that have been crucial in all of that side of my work as well. So, and thank you all for listening. Right. Thank you very much for your excellent talk there. Um, yeah, it definitely sounds like you've got some very interesting results and very promising for the uh, future of uh, malaria and parasitic yeah, yeah. infections. Um, let's open the floor to questions. Has anyone got one? Just, your, very first, uh, your very first thing where you showed the, the huts and you said the person got gradually sicker and sicker, had they you know, gone to a doctor <coughs> in the first you know, couple of weeks rather than wait six months. Are there treatments then that would have cured the problem or in fact you get a bit like rabies, you get right to the end and there's virtually no cure? Good question, yeah. So the, the, the type of disease I guess caused by the Rhodesians parasite, which is the one that I'm looking at, progresses really, really fast. So had they sought treatment within maybe the first few weeks, um, then maybe, but the symptoms of the first few weeks are just like general cold and flu symptoms, so most people don't. Um, in that first stage though, there is a drug that is fairly effective at treating it. Beyond that, the only treatment option is the one that I was describing. So yeah, that's really the issue is that the symptoms are not very characteristic until you get past that point. And yeah, I feel like most people wouldn't go to a doctor if they had a flu most of the time, especially in these really rural settings. Presumably, a, like a blood sample would pick up the parasite in the blood node early on, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, I think I think it also would be easier to diagnose um, earlier as well before it enters the central nervous system. Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, you might have already said this, and I might have just missed it. But what do you do you know what part of the parasite the drugs are actually targeting? Like, is there a particular part of it, or is it just sort of, it seems to work? Good question. Um, <laughs> currently, no, we don't actually know the mode of action of these compounds. I have tried very hard to get some mode of action testing done, and I've sent compounds off to various places, and we haven't received any results. So that's a work in progress, has been for many years. So. Yeah, currently we know that they're active, but we don't know how they actually have their activity, yeah. what target sites they're acting in, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned that there's an existing drug, I guess, that's somewhat effective. Yeah. How similar is this in terms of this fungus, fungus form? It's a completely different looking molecule. Yeah, completely uh, different. So it may not even have the same mode of action, no idea. Yeah, I doubt that it will have the same mode of action. I. <laughs> believe that 
the current drug that can treat the second stage of this disease is an arsenic-based drug, and I think purely like the toxicity of that is what has its effect. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, my structures are completely different, so I doubt it would have the same, yeah. <laughs> Do we have any last questions? No? Well, let's uh, thank Ashley again. <laughs> uh, the next speaker is uh, Nicholas Stapleton from um, UWA, and he's going to be speaking on um, extending Titan mineralogy. Um, so he won the poster prize uh, for determining suitable periodic DFT methods for modeling Titan relevant molecular minerals in a physical chemistry symposium of the RSCI and symposium poster prize section. Um, so his um, supervisors are um, Dino Spagnoli and um, Stephen Mugark, and I think there's a couple of others, um, but yeah. Um, so his um, research project is extending on the knowledge of Titan's mineralogy through a mix of experimental and computational, computational techniques. So I'm sure he's going to give us a, a big insight of all these supercomputers and um, looks like he's going to um, and so to use some of the um, diffraction techniques there as well. Um, so yes, please welcome to the stage Nick. I'm Nick and I'll be presenting my research so far on extending, extending Titan's mineralogy through uh, modelling Titan relevant molecular minerals. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge that the research for this project has been conducted on the lands of the Wajak Noongar and the Darawal peoples' uh, lands. So, uh, Titan is Saturn's largest moon, and it's actually the only moon in the entire solar system that um, possesses a dense atmosphere. And the atmosphere of Titan largely consists of nitrogen and methane gas. Um, <clears throat> these, there's also a little bit of this hydrogen gas and carbon monoxide, but also a huge variety of trace organic molecules. These are generated high up in the atmosphere and uh, they're broken apart by incoming radiation and charged particles that come from the sun and Saturn's magnetic field. These split the uh, nitrogen and methane gases into uh, radicals and small charged species that recombine to form larger compounds. Uh, these heavier molecules that form uh, g become aerosols and sort of stratify out into these haze layers that you should be able to see banding across the top, which is the cause for Titan's color and opacity of the atmosphere. Uh, eventually, these molecules and the other molecules that are generated settle down onto the surface of the moon. Unfortunately, uh, comparatively, very little is known about Titan's surface uh, composition compared to its atmosphere, which is due to the fact that it's mostly opaque in the visible and infrared spectrum. Uh, here is a plot of relative intensity of reflection signal that comes back up from Titan's surface as a function of wavelength. And the most important bit here are these gray bars, which basically denote regions where the spectrum uh, just, it, it, sorry, where everything just absorbs. And this is due to the composition of the atmosphere itself, which of the mostly nitrogen, and, uh, nitrogen gas and methane. Uh, and the aerosols that are formed up in the high uh, atmosphere, they're the responsible for the atmosphere being opaque in the visible spectrum. So what we know about Titan's surface comes from largely from the Cassini-Huygens mission that NASA sent out about 20 years ago now. Um, this was the Cassini satellite which orbited around Saturn and Titan and then the Huygens which was actually a lander probe that descended through the atmosphere. Unfortunately, Huygens was mostly designed to collect atmospheric data so it couldn't really collect uh, all that much surface data. What we do know, however, is that the average surface temperature of Titan is around 90 to 94 Kelvin and the pressure is actually about one and a half times that of Earth at sea level. Um, these conditions mean that the molecules that are uh, generated up in the atmosphere, which consist of, it's just basically nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen containing uh, organic molecules, exist as sort of stable condensed phases on the surface, as opposed to on Earth where they would likely be liquids or gases. And this means Titan actually has these geological features that are somewhat similar to the Earth's. As you can see here, this is a uh, uh, shows Huygens descending through the atmosphere of Titan, and you can see these plain June features sort of spiking up around as you get closer to the surface. Uh, in addition, uh, methane and ethane, of which there is uh, quite a lot of on Titan, uh, exist as liquids, and because of this, they actually form a sort of, uh, not a hydrological cycle, 
because that's based on water, but it's sort of a methane logical cycle. You have these rains and lakes and rivers. <clears throat> and so the pure compounds that deposit down from the atmosphere can actually undergo a physical processing from this weather and other geological events to potentially form molecular co-crystals. Molecular co-crystals are a type of crystal we have two or more molecules that are uh, arranged together in a fixed stoichiometric ratio. So here I have a sort of a chart of potential co-crystals that could be found on Titan. Uh, up on the sides here, I have just a list of what I've been calling them co-formers, as in the two molecules that form together to make the co-crystal. Um, this is just a list of molecules that have been uh, found to actually exist on Titan or are very likely to exist on the surface. Um, I'd like to point out that this is definitely not an exhaustive list of everything. This is just basically what I could reasonably fit onto a slide. But um, the white boxes here are the potential combinations of these two. And this is everything that's been confirmed so far about these potential uh, co-crystals I could form, which is only eight. Uh, and of these eight, only six of them actually have been structurally determined. So you can see there's a very large uh, scope for further research in this area. So why extend Titan's mineralogy? Well, firstly, it's unknown how the geological processes and the weather affect and interact with the molecular minerals on Titan's surface. And in addition, study in this field will potentially aid to future missions um, to Titan. For example, NASA's Dragonfly. Uh, this is planned to land on Titan sometime in the mid-2030s, which gives me about 15 years to find out if everything I've done is completely wrong. And um, you can see it's got this sort of rotorcraft design on it. And the idea being that once a uh, dragonfly lands on the surface, it'll be able to pick itself back up and fly to a different area and pick up uh, different data from hopefully a different uh, geological region. It will also is specifically designed for surface compositional analysis uh, compared to Huygens. There's also some possible applications on Earth for my project uh, because it's focused on low strength bonding chemistry. Uh, these, this is sort of a relevant thing for pharmaceutical productions, like, for example, forming co-crystals in pharmaceuticals or potent, potentially um, macromolecular assemblies. So my project is split into a, an experimental section and a computational section, so I'll be starting with the computational work that I've done so far on it. Um, I've been using uh, periodic density functional theory, or DFT, and just so everyone's on the same page, DFT is a quantum chemical computational method used to model crystalline systems. Because of its periodicity, it means you can model a, a bulk hole, but based on a fairly small uh, actual part that you're modeling. Um, sets of crystals are used in literature to benchmark periodic, different uh, periodic DFT methods to figure out which one performs the best. But these are um, often constructed to represent a wide range of molecules and types of crystals, and therefore intermolecular interactions. However, the molecules on Titan almost exclusively contain carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. So these generic benchmark sets are not necessarily suitable when considering just Titan relevant molecules. So we found it necessary to sort of start this by constructing a benchmark set based on just Titan relevant molecules. So we put together four of the structurally determined uh, co-crystals and their five corresponding co-formers. And we've been using these to screen uh, 12 different um, periodic DFT methods. And I've been carrying these out with the VAST program, and notably I've included the use of the recent D4 dispersion correction. So to begin with, we were looking at how well the different levels of theory perform in terms of recreating unit, uh, experimental unit cell volumes. This is a good measure of how well a level of theory recreates the geometry of a cell. Uh, this plot shows the 12 different levels of theory uh, in terms of a percentage volume difference between the calculated results and the experimental um, unit cell volume. The black circles are the mean percentage deviations of each level of theory, that is to say, the, like, the average value of the method. Um, to begin with, these uh, first six I have here are uh, three different functionals, which is the PVE, the RPVE, and the RevPVE, and I paired them with the slightly older D3BJ correction and then the D4 dispersion correction. And in every case, the D4 dispersion correction has been a direct improvement over the D3BJ, which you'd hope it would be, being a more recent version. 
<coughs> where every time it uh, has, has got a good increase in the uh, percentage volume difference and it brought it around about at least 2% closer to zero. And usually we saw it also slightly reduce the range over which uh, the results were spread. Uh, on the whole, this RPD, where's the button? This RPD D4 function will be found to be the best performing DFT method. Not only did it have the smallest range over which the results were spread, but also the mean percentage deviation closer to zero is actually incredibly close, just 0.1% off. Next up, we looked at crystal lattice energies. This is a similar plot to before in terms of it's a, a percentage difference between the calculated and the reference values uh, for crystal lattice energies. Uh, but for this, we were realistically only able to get four um, uh, systems to have the crystal lattice energies because it gets a little complicated when you start thinking about co-crystals. Um, the positive values on this means that uh, the functional is over-binding a system and then the molecules are interacting, interacting too strongly, and the negative values means they're under-binding and the uh, crystals aren't being held together strongly enough, uh, as strongly as they should be. Um, in general, we found that there was a large tendency for over-binding, especially in these last six, which are these Van der Waals uh, dispersion functionals. <clears throat> and interestingly, the D4 correction didn't always improve over the D3BJ, which was mostly this uh, Rev PD D4 became quite strongly overbinding for the most part. So overall, the best three performing functionals we found to be the RPB D3BJ and RPB D4, and this Rev Van der Waals DF2 functional. Um, they all have very similar mean deviations, especially considering the accuracy of DFT as a method. So it's a little difficult to say which one uh, outright performs the best, but they all seem to be reasonably good. Uh, overall, the RPB functional, RPB D4 uh, DFT method is probably the best uh, method for modeling tide minerals, as it's performed amongst the best here, but also was out and out the best for recreating uh, unit cell volumes. So, moving on to the experimental side of things, uh, I've mostly been doing works, or I've been doing, the work I'll be showing has been with X-ray diffraction, which it's basically the ideal technique for structurally determining new uh, crystals. <clears throat> and I've been doing all my experiments under high pressure from about 0 to 5 uh, gigapascals with the use of a Merrill Bassett diamond anvil cell. And these are devices that essentially squeeze two diamonds together where the tips have been cut off. It's a very small surface area, so a little bit of applied pressure between the diamonds generates very large pressures in between. Now the diamond anvil cell itself is actually quite small, it's about that big or matchbox sized sort of. And there's a little tungsten plate that goes between the diamonds where a hole's drilled through that that's a few hundred microns across and that's actually where the sample gets loaded. Um, and you measure pressure within one of these banks by including a few ruby chips inside with the sample since ruby has a known fluorescence that shifts characteristically with pressure. So straight chain nitriles are strong candidates for molecules on Titan's surface. The uh, lower chain ones have been actually detected and are known to exist, and the longer chain ones have been uh, predicted to exist in relatively large quantities. Uh, however, only a C nitrile has actually been characterized in depth. Uh, every other longer chain nitrile doesn't have a high pressure structure, and if you go not even too much higher, you don't see any structures at all. And so this sort of begs the question of why study these at high pressure, because admittedly the pressures that I have gone to are not something that you realistically get to see on Titan, especially for these molecules. However, the high pressure studies provides a unique avenue of information about intermolecular interactions that you don't uh, get just using low temperature uh, experiments. And so we were able to successfully form and characterize a single crystal of both propionitrile and butane nitrile. So first off with the propionitrile, we've uh, actually managed to develop a way of drawing these without needing to heat up the diamond anvil cell, which is what you normally have to do to get a single crystal. Uh, we found that uh, upon increasing the pressure, it initially crystallized out at 2.7 gigapascals, but there was a large pressure hysteresis where it remained crystalline all the way down to about 0.94. Um, and as we were getting towards the end, we could physically see the crystals starting to melt, so we were able to catch the melting partway through, increase it slightly and go back and forth a bit until um, a single crystal was actually caught. As you can see, 
a bit hard to see because something else got trapped in the Duncan Anvil cell as well, but it wasn't crystalline, so it didn't matter. Um, and that is the single crystal, which we were actually able to characterize from this, uh, even though there's a bit of a mess of this polycrystalline mass down the bottom. Uh, excitingly, we found that the propion natural actually uh, crystallizes into a new structure at high pressure, different to the low temperature structure I have over here. The unit cell has uh, half the number of molecules as the low temperature phase, and also the intermolecular interaction between the nitrile group on one molecule and the hydrogen from a meth uh, methyl group on another, the angle of the interaction actually changes as well. It becomes a lot closer to 180 degrees. Uh, and also, yeah, this was increasing the pressure to 1.3 GPA. We found that was when the single crystal grew to fill the top half of the cell, and then the polycrystalline mass expanded to fill the rest of it. Um, it's not actually an exciting color like this. This is just polarized white. Otherwise, you're looking at a completely colorless crystal. And for butane nitrile, we found a similar pressure hysteresis. Uh, this time, it crystallized out at around 4.5 gigapascals, and we were able to bring it down to 1.1. Uh, this time we got a much nicer single crystal and were able to not have any polycrystalline mass. Um, and for butane nitrile, we found it actually crystallized out into the same space group and structure as the low temperature phase. So this is this over here. Uh, although with a slightly reduced unit cell and volume due to the applied pressure. Uh, butane nitrile in general adopts this gauche conformation in the solid phase. And we did some ab initio calculations, which indicated this is also the most stable conformation in the gas phase. So the low temperature or the high pressure structure aren't uh, forcing the molecule to go into a position that it doesn't want to go into. So some future work includes uh, completing periodic DFT calculations for two additional uh, co-crystals and the new co-former to expand their Titan relevant benchmark set up to 12 crystals in total. Uh, they also hope to form and structure characterize single crystals and some longer chain nitriles inside a diamond anvil cell and potentially get some co-crystals forming between these in the DAC as well. And thirdly, which I did not have time to present, was uh, characterizing novel co-crystals using uh, the Wombat and Echidna powder bean lines at ANSO, where these I have been forming, trying to form co-crystals at time relevant conditions exactly because they have these very impressive uh, large cooling tanks, they can get things down to like 5 Kelvin if you really want to. So uh, I'd like to thank my supervisors, Dino, Helen, and Stephen for supporting me throughout this so far, and Ainsy and my RTP stipend for funding the research basically. Uh, also thanks to Palsy for letting me use a lot of core hours to get this, uh, all the calculations done. And also additional thanks to Stephen and Gemma for help in the lab with all the XRD work and James Brooks for providing the ab initio calculations. Thanks for listening. Okay, another uh, brilliant talk. I could tell why these um, two um, won the um, prizes last year. Um, so yeah, let's open the uh, floor to um, some questions. Go for it. sort of the thing is these things are pretty loosely bound because it's like uh, most of these uh, have most of the co-crystals have melting points that are like below like 150 Kelvin which you know doesn't matter if you're on Titan because the average surface temperature is 90 and relatively speaking quite strongly bound together form like rocks and sands and stuff but um, yeah there's uh, a co-crystal that we might have found a new co-crystal we might have found with some ANSO work um, that that might actually be relevant for, but um, yeah, haven't able to, been able to actually get the structure out of the data yet. So, Jacob, yeah. 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 
place. Oh yeah. Yeah, well, you don't have a crystal, you load in a liquid, and then it stays liquid, and then you crystallize it. So, and, and then when you, and then how do you get the x-rays up? I'm just interested oh, in yeah, how the, the geometry works, so that you can, so there's diamond up above and below. Yeah, there's a 40 degree angle that you can actually get through on this bit here. Okay. The, the diamonds in this aren't quite as big as they actually are in real life. I mean, everything's tiny, but like, relatively speaking where you can get x-rays in going up and down around here. And so it's like fairly limited angles. And but you all the diamond peaks. I mean, yeah, fortunately there's not too many of those because it's so pretty you, simple. Okay, so you just put that out and then you, you have... Yeah, yeah. The, the other thing is you occasionally get... Oh, not occasionally, you also get a... I think it's a tungsten, like a ring from the tungsten. Oh, yeah, yeah. But that's also like quite faint. Oh, that's quite, yeah. Yeah, because it's also quite faint, so that one really doesn't matter. And um, especially with this, because it's all single crystal stuff, all the programs are looking for like sharp peaks and stuff, so it'll just ignore rings if you tell it to. Um, yeah, I'll follow up on a question with that one if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so, you did these experiments at the neutron diffraction def um, facility. Uh, not, not these ones, these are just x rays at UW. Okay, cool. Um, it's right, because when you said you're using one bat and echidna, that would be at the, um, in Sydney? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, how come you chose to um, go there rather than just using um, synchrotron um, beamline for that? Because um, they can also offer those facilities, yeah, can't they? The point with, I mean, I, I've actually also asked for some synchrotron beam time, and fingers crossed I get that, but um, the reason for that is at ANSA they're also able to uh, supply um, deuterated molecules. And so that lets you, because hydrogen isn't actually imaged when you use, or it's a bit weird, you don't really see it very well when you do neutron diffraction, but if you swap it out for deuterium instead, then you can actually see it, I think the gist of it. And so they're able to do that, and then a lot of these things, you go, what's the important thing? It's something that's bonded to a hydrogen interacting with something else, and you go, I would like to know where that is. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Um, any other questions? No? Well, um, let's thank um, Nick um, once again for his talk. Um, and then um, before we um, finish up for this evening, I'd just like to um, give both of our speakers um, a little gift from the RACR.